how much should we assume that they know? Okay, so I just I just hit the um, star broadcast button, and so now we are getting started here. And uh, Kathy was just asking me how much should she assume that everyone knows, and I guess my answer to that would be um, most of the viewers that watch these are are advanced uh, or intermediate to advanced uh, knowledge levels in astronomy. These guys are smart. I mean, the space fans that watch these things are, are pretty up on a lot of the basics. So don't be too afraid to uh, use some jargon or talk about some in-depth things if you want to. I'll be happy to uh, clarify things if people, if, if uh, it doesn't make sense. But um, we will, uh, so that's, that's, I guess, the way I would approach that. So hello, everybody. Um, I'm Tony. Tony, and with me is uh, Dr. Alberto Conti, and you're here for another Space Fan Hangout. So I apologize for getting started late um, this today. We, uh, I got a lot of last-minute stuff I had to get done, and then I had to run up and get things set up in Alberto's office because I didn't have a place to be for this Hangout. So it took me a while to get everything set up. So I'm, I appreciate your patience. I know we started 15 minutes late, but um, lots of great stuff going on here today. Uh, and we're going to talk a lot about the early universe and the, uh, and in particular, one of the most important surveys that is going on right now with the Hubble Space Telescope, and we'll get a lot of information on that. So, um, before I start, I kind of want to get everybody uh, remind everybody that I am monitoring the uh, uh, YouTube comment channels. I am monitoring the event page that I that I from which I invited many of you, and I'm looking at your comments here. Um, as well as if you tweet using the, the uh, hashtag SpaceFan, I will see that also. So I hope you guys will use any one of those three things to interact with us, and uh, we'll be able to see your comments. We'll leave some time toward the end of the day to, or toward the end of the session to uh, answer some of them. So we'll go ahead and get started. So let me introduce the people I've got. So with us are a group of people that are members of something called the Candles Collaboration and uh, can the can or the Candles Survey and it is a really big project that they that they have gotten like they've gotten over 900 assigned orbits to them where they will be staring at various parts of the sky and building up uh, information about some of the most distant ga galaxies that we've ever seen. Now, you've, I've uh, had members of the CLASH survey on here before, Dan Coe in particular, uh, and they do similar work using lensing, and I th think we're going to kind of compare and contrast a little bit of that uh, here today. But with me today are is uh, Kathy Cavillia. She's from Johns Hopkins. She does semi-analytic models of low-mass galaxies. It took me a while to get that right, but I finally have it. Uh, Kathy, welcome. Oh, are you muted? Or did yes. I mute you? Yes. Oh, I muted you myself. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> so that, that's a, sort of a two-edged, double-edged sword. At least we don't hear you yeah. typing, but sometimes if you forget to unmute, you may have to, we may have to get you to unmute. Also is uh, Ramil DeVay. Uh, he's a numer... Alberto says he does really good numerical simulations yeah, really cool of galaxy really cool formation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very nice stuff. And we'll talk a little bit about what he does. So, And he is in South Africa. So thank you for joining us, Ramil. You're welcome. Great to be here. All right. Yeah, the University of Western Cape. It's right there on the thing there. Also with us from the University of Texas at Austin is Stephen Finkelstein. Is it Steen or Stein? Finkelstein. Stein. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, galaxy, and he studies galaxy evolution, tracing. He traces how um, most galaxies are tracing how most galaxies evolve over over higher redshifts and uh, uh, how how they sort of change with uh, both distance and the age of the universe. So welcome, Steve. Or is it, do you prefer Stephen? Uh, we can go with Steve. Thanks. Okay. Look forward to it. <laughs> okay. And of course, me and Alberto sitting in his office. Uh, I have been uh, threatened by his cactuses for a while, cacti, for a while. But uh, That's I've been the able only plant I can't kill. So. <laughs> so. True story. All right. So the, the candle survey now. There, I, I have the link to their website um, on the event page. This is the the the, the, the main the main. Uh, Candles um, website, which you guys can visit if you want to. Um, let me just see if I can pull that up real quick here. Uh, let's see. Here it is. So here's their website. It's got all kinds of really cool information. Uh, one of the things that uh, it tells you a lot about the, the, the survey itself, why they're do doing what they're doing, and uh, 
gives you a description of uh, what, what candles will measure, some things about Cosmic Dawn, all kinds of neat things like that. But my favorite thing that that uh, this is while this is a really good and very informative website, one of the things I really that really got me turned on by what the work they were doing was this really outstanding uh, blog that they maintain. Um, trying to make sure I get the right one. Oh, not desktop. Uh, they they have a really good blog. Hang on, I'm getting there. There it is. That is also I also have a link to that in the uh, in the uh, um, in the event page. in the event page as well, so you can visit this. But uh, I guess the things that I like, they're very active on it. They post every several times a week, uh, and they give they do they do posts ranging from all sorts of different things, like what it's like to be an astronomer, the various meetings they pick. They had a really good post on what high Z means in uh, in in, in when we when we say that a galaxy has high redshift, they had a really good post in there on that. So I I would recommend anybody who cares anything about the early universe and cosmology to read this blog. And the other one that I would recommend for cosmology that's one of my favorites was Sean Carroll's Cosmic Variance. But this one is all is is outstanding. Very well done, guys. So I really appreciate the effort you guys put into this. So uh, who wants to go first? I want to I want to talk to you guys a little bit about. Um, the, the the project itself. Who wants to who wants to describe that for us? What you guys are doing, and also tell us what the acronym means. Do I have to pick somebody? Come on! Don't be shy. I, I nominate Romil as our senior member here. <laughs> okay, Romil, <laughs> you you just got nominated. So go ahead, give us a description. Wow. First of all, what does Candle stand for, and what are, what are, what's the overarching goals? Uh, so it's the. Um, now let's see if I get this right. Uh, Cosmic Assembly Near Infrared Deep Extra Extragalactic Legacy Survey. Is that you think? That's it. That's right. <laughs> that's, that's, uh, uh, yeah, that that was quite a challenge just to get that. I mean, you, these days you got to have a cool acronym, otherwise your project's going nowhere. So, uh, <laughs> so that was that was pretty uh, that was pretty good. So the candle survey is. Uh, I think you mentioned you see this in the title. It's the the most number of orbits that's ever been spent on a single project in the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, it's over 900 orbits and <clears throat> the idea is to probe galaxy evolution um, in, in the most deep uh, and, and most uh, a distant way possible that we can using current facilities. Uh, so it's a legacy project intended to sort of be a, a flagship project for the Hubble Space Telescope and um, we've uh, gathered a team of over 100 people, um, most of them observers, but there are a few theorists like myself and, and uh, Rachel Somerville and Kathy. Um, and we have a large number of teams that look at everything from the very most distant galaxies, which Steve, uh, I think, heads up, and uh, as well as uh, things that are sort of during what we call cosmic noon, which is when the, the universe was most actively forming stars around redshift sort of one to three, uh, as well as lower redshift galaxies. So it, it really can, can do the whole gamut. Uh, and the particular advantage is to use the Hubble Space Telescope to go extremely deep and, and find the, most, uh, the faintest, most distant galaxies, the smallest galaxies, the dwarf galaxies, uh, and really expand the, our dynamic range and our ability to probe galaxies uh, across cosmic time. Now you have you have nine over nine hundred orbits assigned to the project. Is that because do you have that? Do you need that many because you need to get these deep views? You need to get you need to build these up over time. And are you how large is the area of the sky you're looking at? Yeah. So the the total area of the sky. Let's see. I think. Um, Steve would know these numbers off the top of his head better than better than I, um, but it's it's a relatively small patch of the sky, sort of you know in a in a grand scheme of things, less than a square degree, uh, but it's spread over five different fields, and the reason we want to um, <coughs> to uh, have this have to spend the 900 orbits, and believe me, you know I think there was a lot of uh, thing about trying to reduce that to as little as possible. Um, so there, there are several uh, goals that we wanted to be able to do. We wanted to be able to probe high range of very high range of galaxies, galaxies during reionization, 
Uh, we wanted to be able to probe down well below L star during cosmic noon. We also are, are doing a supernova survey, so we have recurring visits on, uh, on certain patches of the sky so that we can look for objects that have changed, most likely supernovae uh, have, have suddenly gotten brighter, and uh, that allows us to do some interesting cosmology. Um, so there's, there's a number of different goals in candles, and when you sort of added it all up, uh, really the smallest amount that we could do it with was, was over 900 orbits. But, you know, I want to ask you something because I think the, one of the interesting things about Canada is also the fact that uh, we have an example here, right here, with the, with the three of you right now, is that uh, you have a data set that, I could, that actually can help uh, many, many of the observers, you know, because it's so rich, but it also can help uh, you and can help uh, other people that do theory to actually verify that uh, the simulations in this case are actually on the right track. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so I think that it's been um, wonderful being a theorist on the Candles team uh, that um, I think we're, we're sort of working very closely with the observers and, and that's, you know, that's a, really a lot of fun when, when theory and observations are sort of pushing each other. Uh, that's, that's when I think we get the most exciting science. And we're really at a stage right now where <laughs> I would say that, you know, I, in, in total fairness, I would say the theory is a little behind the observations, uh, but the observations, things like candles, are really pushing us to think in new ways about galaxy evolution and galaxy formation. Uh, and so uh, there's, you know, there's a number of different theorists, and we all use very different tools. You know, uh, Kathy uses semiotic models. I use hydro simulations. There are others that use sort of uh, more uh, use gravity-only simulations with more empirical um, ways of distributing galaxies. So there's many different types of theorists on this on this project as well. Um, so we're probably about 10% of the total population, uh, but still that's a fair number of us, and <laughs> it's it's very exciting because we get access to the to the very latest results, very latest data that that really allow us to constrain our models better, far better than we ever have uh, been so, before. So I don't know, maybe we can do this later, Tony. But I think it would be nice to actually <clears throat> ask. Uh, maybe a little later, actually, I have to ask uh, what the differences are, you know, for the general public in in explaining what a, what a numerical simulation like Romil does and what semi-analytic models are. For yeah, because yeah, when, I, go when I heard semi-analytic, I'm like, what what's that? So yeah. okay, good. I, I think it's a good idea. So you look at roughly that the same. The all 900 orbits are going to be looking at an area of the sky you said is about a, about a square degree, a little bit less maybe. And I, so I figured it out while Romil was talking. It's about oh, okay, a quarter of a square degree, so it looks yeah, like it's a comparable to the size of, of the full moon, if I did that well, right. the full moon, yeah. Okay, good. That's what I was about to... But in uh, five different areas. Well, okay. Okay, so... Uh, uh, in fi oh, in five different areas, yes. not the same area. Okay, nope, so yeah, you're going back... better on the sky. Okay, no, so we don't have any supernova guys here, so I can't ask about how many supernova uh, supernovae have been found this way, but I guess we'll... Uh, We'll hopefully get somebody like that, somebody, one of those guys out here in the future. Now, uh, Ramil, real quick, I just wanted to follow up on something you said about being a theorist. It, it's always been my experience, or at least this is what I always hear, that we have no shortage of models out there, right? There's all kinds of models doing all kinds of things. What we need now are data, like you said, to help constrain those models. And this is one of those, I would think, one of those projects that do that, right? Yes. Okay, so... Absolutely. Uh, We've had, I mean, we've had for years and years people, you know, coming up with all sorts of ideas about what, how the universe works, but we've never really known for sure because we haven't had any observations. And what blows my mind even to this day is that we even can get something, there's even a, a term now that I don't think existed 10 or 20 years ago called transient astronomy. It's, you know, besides the planets and, and uh, things within our solar system, deep sky things didn't generally change that much unless it was a supernova. So, you know, this is really kind of a, a new thing that I find very amazing, you know, seeing all these changes happening and people looking at them and going, well, that model, no, that model sucks. We're not going to be able to use that anymore. Or this one really gets strengthened. So that's really cool. Um, Steve, so uh, in, your, in your work in galaxy evolution, so can you give us sort of an overview of how a galaxy changes and, and how you know that, and how you go about finding out how they change? Sure, that's a great question. So uh, we have a, a decent idea of how we think they change from simulations such as the one uh, Romil runs and Kathy runs. And uh, from the way we 
thank the universe form, the universe started at a big bang. There was essentially no, no structure, no large scale stru structure early times. Things had to start small and get big over time. And so when we look in the universe around us, we see these really, you know, fancy morphologically structured galaxies like the Andromeda galaxy that has big spiral arms or there was a great image released by, by Hubble site today, I think it was M M101 or M104 or something. Uh, we see big elliptical galaxies, um, big, big things with a lot of structure. And when we go back, if you look at simulations of the very, very early universe, those things simply don't exist. So we have to trace things at different times to figure out how you build up big things like the Milky Way. And so we can do this using, using this tool of Redshift, um, which we can talk a, a little bit more about um, if you think we need to. But essentially, because the speed of light is finite, if you look at something that's some distance away, you're seeing it as it was sometime in the past. So it takes light about eight minutes to get from the sun to the Earth. So we're seeing the sun as it is not right now. We're actually seeing as it was about eight minutes ago. And if we go look at the, uh, bit, the largest or the, the, the closest big galaxy, the Andromeda galaxy, I think it's about two million light years away, if that's right. So we're seeing it as it was not right now, but two million years ago, so quite a long time ago in human terms, but that's not that much in astronomical terms. So we can do that, just look, keep looking at further and further away objects. As long as we know the distance to that object, we can figure out actually how far in the past we're looking. And thanks to uh, surveys like candles and also some really deep surveys of the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, um, we can now see galaxies as they existed about 500, 500 million years after the Big Bang. Uh, and for reference, right now, we are about 13.8 billion, with a B, years after the Big Bang. And we're looking at 500 million, with an M, years after the Big Bang. Um, and we're only going to go deeper with the James Webb Space Telescope, which, which maybe we can talk about later. We'll get even a few hundred further years back and see these first galaxies. Um, and so what we do is we simply we find some galaxies of redshift 1, find some galaxies of redshift 2, redshift 3, so on and so forth, and just ca catalog them, see how they change. Uh, and you could do this in any number of ways. You could look at their structure, so look at their morphologies, which there's a large group of people and candles doing. Um, you can look at their stellar masses, so if you weigh these galaxies, essentially how many stars are in them. Uh, you can just look at how bright they are, what their colors are. And when you look at any one of these things, you see strong, strong changes uh, from redshift to redshift. And that is the main goal of what we're doing. Yeah, go okay, ahead. so in the in the areas of sky that candles are looking, in the patches that you're that you're visiting over and over again, what redshift ranges can you see within them? Like, are there? I, I I would be shocked if in the same area of sky you can see redshift one galaxies in the same one that you get to see redshift eleven galaxies in. So you probably have to look at different areas of sky yeah. to see different ones. Uh, what is the typical range. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, within an area of the sky, if, it, if it's big enough, you're going to see galaxies at all redshifts, essentially. At least, uh, you know, redshift 11, the example you gave, you need very, very, very deep imaging to see that. And we, we could talk about that. We may or may not have found a redshift. Well, you know we're going to talk about right. it. <laughs> right. Um, but the other thing you need is you need to figure out, if you look at an image, and I can show one on my, on my desktop in a little bit, you see a bunch of fuzzy little dots. And some yeah. of them are at redshift 2, and some of them are at redshift 8. And yeah, so go ahead and bring it up if it's not too if it's not too difficult. Just go ahead. Uh, and hit, sure. You have the window up. Try this screen share. Let's see what yeah. happens. So you hit screen share. You'll see a uh -huh. whole bunch of options. One of which will be that window with that image in it. Let's do this one. There, there you go. go. Perfect. This is All right. Fancy. All right. Can you can you see my my mouse in this in this image? If I move my mouse around. You move it slowly, and we can, yes. OK, OK. So great. So this is an image of the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. So this is not a Candles image. This is just the one I happen to have up. Okay. Uh, but it uh, is very complementary to Candles data. So this is one tiny pinpoint in the sky that Hubble stared at for a few hundred hours, whereas Candles, we tend to look at each point in the sky for a few hours and then move on to the next part to build wider fields. So they're very complementary. Uh, but if we look at this image, essentially everything you see is outside of the galaxy. I'll try and highlight. There's a star right here that's actually in our galaxy. So what you're doing is you're going over. I, I should point out what's happening here because you're using DS9. So this is a uh, image, a Fitz image viewer. There's a big image in the middle, but up in the upper right corner is a zoom in of where his cursor is. I just wanted to point that out because yeah. it's not uh, like, not completely obvious. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, we can we can zoom into some things. Uh, so there's a star there. There's another star up here. I'm trying to move my mouse around. Yeah. Uh, so but look everything up the upper right of where he's pointing. Yeah. Everything else in there is a galaxy. And some of those bigger, fuzzier ones are fairly nearby galaxies, maybe redshift 0 0.1, redshift 0 0.2. And we could talk about this, this little white circle that I've placed here. This is around the galaxy that possibly might be at a redshift of about 12. And so in just this one 
tiny region of the sky, you can essentially get a decent census of the entire universe. Uh, and so there may be, uh, for example, a few hundred galaxies at a redshift 4 in this image and one galaxy at a redshift of 12. Um, so I thought you, you, bring up your, you, you bring a very, very good point, which is the fact that, uh, that this is how we do astronomy, uh, you know, astronomical experiments, so to speak, right? We don't have uh, the ability like uh, people when they do chem chemistry, chemistry experiment in the lab to actually wait for the experiment to be over and see how things change. We don't have billions of years to wait right for a galaxy to smash into another and form something else. Well, that's what, what Romil does, right? Is, as you said, what we do is we look over the universe and we find uh, sort of prototypes of galaxies at very different ages and we try to reconstruct like a big gigantic puzzle exactly what happens to them as they age. Exactly. So the trick is if I want to compare the redshift 0.1 galaxies and redshift 12 galaxies and everything in between, I need to figure out how to separate these. And so I've zoomed in a little bit. And you can see there are, you know, a few bright things. And, okay, the bright things have got to be close by. But all those other fuzzy dots, they could be anywhere between a redshift of 1 and a redshift of 12. And so the way we do that is with color information. And that means you need to take images with Hubble in different filters. And if you're taking an image for 100 hours in a filter, you're not going to get all the filters that they're on Hubble. There are way too many people that want to use a telescope. <laughs> uh, and so with the filters that we've been imaging with candles, uh, we've looked throughout the optical and also just into the near-infrared, just redder than the eye can see. Uh, we can do redshift about 4 to redshift of 8. Um, there are a few other methods where you can study redshift 2 as well. Um, and so that's a very long answer to your very short question. <laughs> well, all, the, all the redshifts are certainly in the image, but whether we can actually figure out uh, accurately what the redshift is, we can't do that for all the redshifts. Okay. Because the imaging. So you've split. You've split the. Um, presumably, when you said we, we, you've already used the, we've already used the term cosmic dawn, which uh, applies to galaxies uh, that were uh, less than the universe was a billion years old. Um, and then you said, what, you, what was the other thing you said? Cosmic middle age or cosmic what noon? Cosmic, cosmic noon. noon. That's, uh, I, I never heard that before. That's just, actually that's a great way to to characterize the age and where every lots of stuff was happening. I guess, Romil. That's right. It's it's the uh, epoch during. It's about uh, from something like two billion years after the Big Bang to maybe five or six billion years after the Big Bang, when the universe uh, was most actively forming stars. Uh, so galaxies looked quite a bit different uh, back then than they uh, look today. Uh, and uh, candles, of course, sees a lot of these things, and, and particularly. Um, we haven't talked much about this yet, but the near-infrared focus of candles is, is really the, the boon uh, for studying these galaxy populations. Um, and that's, that's, that's the new thing that candles is really uh, bringing to the, to the table, uh, which allows us to weigh these galaxies, get this stellar mass, as Steve was talking about, much better than we were able to do before. And that's kind of a, a very fundamental thing that you want to do with galaxies. You want to be able to know how much, how much stars are in them. <coughs> Uh, it's kind of the first thing you want to know about a, a distant galaxy, uh, and so candles allows us to do that, which is which is really great uh, during cosmic noon, particularly. So before I, I want to bring Kathy into the discussion here in just a minute, but before I, I leave this topic, I want to talk about so cosmic noon is is between two billion and what was the other uh, five or six billion years roughly. Okay, so afternoon. what's what's in the afternoon from present until two billion? Or, red, or was it redshift two? I forgot. Yeah, redshift two. It's sort of redshift one to three. One, one to three. Okay. Yes. Okay. So one, one and a half to. Yeah, you know, it's a it's a fuzzy thing, but. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it's important to it's important to get it right. I mean, I, I like the I like the analogy. So, Kathy, um, let's bring you into the discussion here. And uh, what? So you're 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 doing semi analytic <laughs> models. Well, we yes. have to find out first what that means. So you have a purely numerical simulation when you model the smallest things that you can as accurately as you can, and you track it all, and it takes forever. Um, That's what Ramil. And you have to be very clever. Mm -hmm. That's what Ramil does. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah. <laughs> I'll take forever. Um, <laughs> I'll take forever. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, it takes forever. Well, but you, have to, you have to use supercomputers for this, right? For the work he does. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yes. yes. Well, for what Kathy does too. Anyway, go ahead. Well, I, I actually run the simulations that I work with on my desktop, and it takes four, eight hours. Depends on how much I'm running. In any case, 
Um, so that's one end of the spectrum. At the other end of the spectrum, you have pure theory. You write down some equations and you solve them. And so that's an analytic model. Sort of halfway in between is the semi-analytic model. Um, so it takes a, a pre-existing dark matter history, essentially, of a galaxy and goes in and pastes on top of that how the baryons work. Um, so you can say, all right, I have this much gas in the galaxy, and you don't, you don't describe exactly where it is. You assume some things about its shape. Um, and as you go on, you say, OK, I think that gas turns into stars this way, so we'll, we'll make it do that. And you put in a little function that does that for your time step. And you, you make a whole bunch of these recipes and these uh, mass buckets, essentially, um, and pour things from one bucket to the other in a certain way. And eventually, you end up with your output galaxy. And so it takes sort of analytic um, recipes for how things evolve from one place into another. Um, but you're also doing it numerically, because you, can't, you couldn't do it by hand, even if you wanted to. Um, just, uh -huh. Does that make sense? It does. And, <laughs> okay. and I, did, I just want to uh, make sure we define a couple of terms you use. You said baryonic material or matter. Uh, that is just ordinary matter, things like uh, protons, neutrons, electrons, mm -hmm. things like that, correct? Yes. So I just, that was a, that's a, just wanted to kind of verify that. Anything you know, that you know, periodic that part. So we have, a new, we have a new member in our Hangout, uh, Joel and Nina. Is that you in the background? Yes. Hi. 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 Sorry you were a little late. That's quite all right. I, I saw you guys appear a couple of times and then you went yeah, away. I wasn't working on my computer for some reason, so I'm glad oh. you came back just in time. Yeah, I apologize for getting the link to you so late, too. That was part of my, my fault because I, got, I was getting behind and setting everything up. So why don't you introduce yourselves? And uh, we've only, we, we, we've just been talking about the Candles Project, uh, big picture stuff, you know, big, you know, science, some of the science is doing and, and things like that. So uh, why don't you first of all introduce yourselves and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll carry on. So my name's Joel Primack. Uh, I'm, uh, as much as anyone, uh, one of the main creators of the modern theory of the universe, the Lambda CDM picture. Uh, I uh, work with Rachel Somerville. I was her thesis advisor in creating some of the modern uh, semi-analytic modeling technology. Uh, Rachel is uh, Kathy Caviglia's advisor. Uh, and uh, I also am involved now uh, in producing and uh, uh, analyzing a large number of galaxy simulations. Uh, we have currently 30 high-resolution galaxy simulations running on uh, big supercomputers, and we've run about 60. And we're in the process of generating uh, many tens of thousands of images of these uh, uh, high-resolution simulated galaxies, uh, which within a couple of weeks we're going to be able to give to Galaxy Zoo. Uh, and they're going to look just like the uh, actual Hubble images in the sense that although uh, we use our sunrise code to make very realistic images in the rest frame, uh, we degrade those images uh, to correspond to uh, the resolution of Hubble for galaxies in this cosmic high noon period uh, that you were talking about a little while ago. Uh, and we also add noise, uh, which is actually just noise taken from real data. Uh, and uh, so those are going to go through just the same sort of pipeline for analysis as the real uh, galaxy images from Hubble Space Telescope. And uh, we'd like to have those classified by uh, the Galaxy Zoo folks, and uh, at least several thousand of our images are also going to be classified by the same professional astronomers that have been classifying the Candel's Hubble images. So uh, Nina me... should also say a few words. <clears throat> okay. So I'm, uh, in addition, <clears throat> I'm also the uh, director of the University of California's system-wide high-performance astrocomputing center, and Nina is the uh, education and outreach coordinator for uh, the University of California High Performance Astrocomputing Center, HIPAC for short. 
So Nina, can you say a few words? Yeah, hi. As Joel said, I'm Nina, and I'm the visualization, education, and outreach person for UC HIPAC. And basically, we're generating all these incredible simulations and visualizations within the astro computing community. And my mission is to get this material out in order to help communicate our research to the general public. So I'm I'm thrilled that this is happening, and I'm glad that we can be a part of it. <laughs> Incidentally, our website, hipacc.ucsc.edu, has lots of uh, material that is of broad interest to the public. Including, I will make uh, sure that link gets put on the in the description box below this video on YouTube once it gets posted, and on the event page as great. well, so you guys can get there. Okay, so let me let me get this straight. So you guys are generating simulations, a lot of lots and lots of data. First of all, how much data are you generating? We're actually storing about a, a terabyte a day right now, uh, just from these galaxy simulations that we're running. Uh, and <clears throat> for each of the 30 simulations that we're analyzing, we stored about 50 uh, snapshots. So as the simulations run, they correspond to different redshifts, different times after the Big Bang. Uh, and so for each one of the times that we've stored, uh, we make realistic images, typically from 10 different directions, and in many different wave bands. And we then can combine those to correspond to any filter that Hubble Space Telescope has. So we synthesize images in all the wave bands that are accessible, and uh, typically seven or eight wave bands. Uh, and those are the images that are analyzed by the professional astronomers. For purposes of uh, uh, Galaxy Zoo, they, they want to have uh, three color composite images. So we will construct those images and uh, we will have the first set of several tens of thousands of images available within two weeks. So you, 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 run, you, you run the simulations, you take the data, you get the, the simulations are going to put out these really nice kind of fake looking things and then you add some noise, add some color, make it look like it was taken through a, you maybe add I don't know, Hubble's point spread function or something to it. Exactly. The point spread function, by the way, is just the thing that a telescope does to a point source. You, you, it always, no matter how good the optics, there's always a, a, a spreading out of the light. So you kind of smear out the stars a little bit using that, and then that is what gets over to Galaxy Zoo. Exactly. And what's the, what are you hoping to learn? Uh, what are you trying, why go through this exercise? Why create a bunch of data from your simulation, your simulations, which you know what they are because you created them, and then have someone else tell you. What because the basic question we're trying to answer is whether our simulations are very much like the real universe. Uh, so each galaxy is basically its own story. They're complicated. Uh, these high re these high redshift galaxies are not like nearby galaxies. Nearby galaxies are basically disks and spheroids, uh, at least the big galaxies. But the galaxies in the early universe are disturbed. They often have uh, interactions occurring. Uh, they'll often have lots of clumps in which stars are forming. We see these things in the real universe. Our simulations also produce similar structures. And the question is, how similar are the galaxies that we create in the computer to the galaxies that Hubble Space Telescope sees? Great. So it's a way of kind of verifying your simulation, your models, make sure that they, they match reality. And the role, I'm still trying to get what you're going to get from Galaxy. You're just going to have Galaxy Zoo do a lot of uh, classifications for you and then see if it matches the astronomers, what they're doing? We're, we're, actually, we're going to be doing both things. So on the one hand, we're going to be looking at what the astronomers do for the few thousand galaxies that the astronomers are willing to classify of our artificial ones. Astronomers will usually classify 200 galaxies a week and we might get a month's work out of them. So that's a thousand galaxies. And of course we'd like to have each galaxy image classified by three to five people so that we can uh, normalize for variation between individual classifiers. Sure. So we'll have, we expect, a few thousand galaxies classified by, uh, galaxy images classified by uh, professional astronomers including the grad students who are working on the Candles project. And uh, Galaxy Zoo, on the other hand, will classify every single image. And they'll be classified, typically, by a number of different people. So one of the questions that we're interested in is, to what extent 
for the few thousand galaxy images that have been classified by professionals, both real galaxies and uh, the, these artificial images, uh, how similar are the classifications by the professionals and the classifications by the galaxy zoo folks? Assuming that they're sufficiently similar that we trust the galaxy zoo folks, the next question is going to be, uh, since we're going to get vast amounts of data uh, from galaxy zoo, uh, how can we use that data to compare real galaxies and simulated galaxies? So uh, when do you when do you anticipate getting this? So your simulations are running now. They're crunching all the the, the data sets. Are creating the data sets. When do you anticipate getting this stuff over to Galaxy Zoo? Within two weeks. So the simulations that we're analyzing now finished several months ago. So uh, we've now covered the entire range of redshifts that we're probing in the so-called cosmic high noon period. Uh, roughly from redshift one and a half out to redshift four. Yeah, we were just uh, talking about that before you joined. We just we right. We also so from roughly we about ten billion years ago, uh, back to the beginning. To, right, to, right. To a hundred to a billion years after the Big Bang. That's that's the period that that we're focusing on, because we've okay. got pretty good images from Hubble, and uh, of course when we run these galaxy simulations, we have to start at the Big Bang and run forward from that. Uh, so okay. we cover that that whole range. Uh, we're currently running another 30 simulations uh, and within a few months we'll have the output from those and we'll produce images from those. And, right, okay, uh, and, and this will that will also go over to the Galaxy Zoo as well. Right? And yes. If I could just interject, the, the sure. idea as I understand it, we have all these visualizations of galaxies or sunrise simulations of galaxy formations and if you pause the, this visualization at one point you see a galaxy mid-formation, mid-evolution, and if you can connect that image to something, to a Hubble image, then that can help us understand the evolution and the formation of that Hubble galaxy that we're seeing in the Hubble image. So it's really to help us understand the evolution of galaxies. Yeah, actually, Nina explained something I probably should have. When we run the simulations, of course, we understand exactly what the computer is doing, because it's doing what we told it to do. Right. Uh, and if those images actually look a lot like the real galaxies, uh, both in the classification and also in things that we can easily measure, like the distribution of light in the image, the, the sizes of the image, the biggest size and the smallest size, that kind of thing, uh, then we can have some confidence that we actually understand how galaxies are made. Uh, you should understand that the ability to make realistic galaxies from simulations has only been possible in the last year or two. Before then, nobody, no matter how good their computers and how big their, their uh, uh, simulation project, succeeded in making galaxies that actually look like real galaxies. And uh, now we're just beginning to be able to do that with high resolution simulations. So. Uh, this well, is, that's because the, that's because the tablet, the, I, the iPad just really came out. <laughs> <laughs> what was that? Sorry, I was making a joke. That's because that's because the iPad jo only just recently came out, and now we can. <laughs> have it, so, yeah. Okay, uh, but I want to ask you actually a question, Joel. So uh, this is Alberto Conti, Space Telescope. So uh, when you talk about simulations, this is actually the simulate. Before you came on, we were talking with Ro Romil and Kathy about the differences between pure numerical simulations and semi-analytic models. So. Are these a combination of both, or are these pure numerical simulations? These are numerical simulations, and uh, let me explain that what Ramil has been pioneering and doing extremely well is not to simulate individual galaxies, but to simulate a region of space that will contain hundreds or, or more uh, galaxies. And that's very important if you're trying to understand what happens in the space in between the galaxies, uh, the space around galaxies and the space of uh, far from galaxies because of the uh, energy and the material that's ejected from galaxies. Uh, but what we're doing is focusing on individual galaxies and their immediate environments. And we're, we're taking essentially the complete power of powerful supercomputers and spending millions of CPU hours, of processor hours on the big machines to do these simulations. Uh, and we hope that the computer codes that we're using now are sufficiently realistic that we can actually begin to make galaxies that look like the real galaxies. And there, there are fundamental questions that we don't fully understand about how galaxies form. For example, stars mostly form in disks, but most of the stars today are not in disks. They're in big spheroids. 
and little spheroids. So how do the stars, how does the material get into the spheroids? And also, once the spheroids get sufficiently big, these sort of spherical star combinations, then the galaxy stops forming stars. There's lots of gas around these galaxies, but nevertheless, it doesn't turn into stars. We say that the galaxy has quenched, and it stays quenched. What's the basic physics that's making that happen? Does so it have something once, to do with the turn, supermassive they, black holes? They turn into these, you're saying once they turn into these spheroid shapes, star formation ceases? If they're sufficiently big, that's what we see. That, that's what the universe is telling us happens. Mm -hmm. And the question is, why is it happening? Yeah. And uh, we have some guesses, but we're not sure. And so one of the things we're trying to do is to figure out what the cause is. Okay. Well, that's uh, that's amazing. I didn't know. I, I had no, I I had never really realized that was a a question that needed answering. That's amazing. Um, so w w let me. Uh, I want to get to. I was talking to Kathy very briefly when uh, right right when you guys joined up, and I want to get back to her real quick. Um, you so you're working on. You told us what semi-analytic models are. Now, what about low mass galaxies? Can you describe for us, or at least define for us, what you mean by low mass galaxies? <laughs> So, for my purposes, it really de depends on who you ask uh, what low mass really means. Um, but for me, it's for <coughs> halo masses less than about 10 to the 10.5 solar masses. Um, so, so it's below L star. Smaller than the Milky Way. Mm -hmm. That's about 30 times smaller than the Milky yes. Way. Yes, they're okay. little guys. Um, yeah. Good. I was just trying to figure out. I was doing it in my head. Alberto's over here going, that's 10 billion. <laughs> <laughs> but it's actually good to have a unit like the, the Milky Way. And then you yeah, I was, I was, trying, to, yeah, I was, I was trying to do a quick calculation. Yeah. So how many Milky Ways is that? So, okay. So About thank 30. you. Thank you, Joel. That, that's perfect. So, um, and, uh, and so your work with these, with these models, um, are, there, are there models that you find more... Um, I guess, are, first of all, are there are a lot of these models. Are there a lot of different ones that help describe the, the low mass galaxies? Um, semi analytic models? There are tens, I believe. Uh, and the different. candles the candle survey is helping you sort of narrow these down? Yes. Uh, well, not. So, do you mean model by. By model, do you mean code or do you mean. Um, recipes. Yeah, I'm not sure what, what I mean. I yeah, think you I, made a recipe. Yeah, I think I mean. So you're running these similar these models. They're they're telling you things about low mass galaxies, and now and you're on the candles collaboration. So presumably you're using the data to do something to help you understand these, right? So uh, are are the the candles are the candles data supporting a certain? Would you say recipe? Yeah, I call it recipe. I guess in a sense it's a, it's a, it's a a uh, predetermined set of, uh, in this case, for semi-analytic models, of uh, uh, parameters that you can tweak, you know, the, how many stars are forming at a given time, what is the feedback from supernova, and so on and so forth. And so you decide those, and then you compare that with uh, with reality, right, so to speak, with the, with the universe at large, yeah. right? Yeah, okay. Yeah, so, what I'm trying to do is get a sense of how is the candles data helping you in your work? So the basic output of a semi-analytic model, um, a cosmological simulation. You can also do single halos, but um, for candles purposes, uh, you make a whole bunch of galaxies. And then you look at the statistics of their um, properties, like how many galaxies do we have with this particular stellar mass. Um, and those sorts of things you can observe with candles. And the better the, the data that you're comparing to, the better you can constrain your, your recipes. Okay. I, I can jump in. This is Joel Pimack again, yep. and give you a little bit more information about this specific Candles project comparing semi-analytic models. The project is being led by Yu Lu, a postdoc at Stanford working with Risa Wexler. And uh, there are basically three different semi-analytic models that are uh, being compared. Uh, one of them is the model that Kathy's been working on, uh, the master of that model is Rachel Somerville. And I've been a, I mean, Rachel's my former student. I've been a collaborator on this for many years. Uh, another model is Darren Croton's model. Uh, Darren produced the model that was the basic model used uh, to turn the Millennium Simulation, a very large simulation of uh, the universe, uh, into galaxies. 
uh, these new models are all being based on a different big simulation, a better one, called uh, the Bolshoi simulation, which my group produced. The third model is Yulu's own semiolytic model. So these semiolytic models use very different recipes. Yulu's model quenches galaxies, in other words, stops star formation, just based on the mass of the dark matter halo. So it's called halo quenching. Darren Croden's model, Darren is now in Australia, his model uses both the halo mass, but primarily uh, it assumes that there's a massive black hole and it uses the properties of the dark matter halo plus the black hole. Uh, and that's called in the trade radio mode uh, quenching. So the idea is that the black hole is producing energy that keeps the gas from cooling and forming stars. In the Somerville model, radio mode quenching is included, very much the same recipe as in uh, Darren Croton's model, but in addition we have a big blowout phase where when the black hole is rapidly fed with gas, it produces a big explosion and it blows the gas out of the galaxy. And so what we're doing among other things, is comparing these different schemes to see which one works the best in actually agreeing with the Candell's data. Awesome. We normalize the model at low redshift using the nearby data from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, and then we compare with the Candell's data out to redshift four, five, six. Okay. That's okay. None of the models just, is a terrifically good match to the data. <laughs> I was just saying that you know, have problems. For the people that, that don't understand some of this, I guess, I suppose the, when you mean normalize, you basically, you're trying to do and try to compare, basically, uh, you know, your models with the, what I call reality, so to speak, with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey and take a look at what the properties of that survey tell yeah, you well, about. In particular, what we're, what we're requiring the models to match is what yes. we call the mass function, the That's number right. of galaxies per mass interval at low redshift. And all the models can do an excellent job of matching the observed population of galaxies as a function of their mass. Uh, so that's the, the requirement that all the models have to do. But then the models okay. disagree on their predictions as you go back at the, to the early universe, which is what Candles is observing. So I want to take some time because we're running out. It's, uh, it's already 5 o'clock. You have to go, don't you? I have to go very soon. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So Alberto may be zipping out here real yeah. quick because he's got another meeting. But um, I want to get to some of the comments. And one of them is from... Uh, oh man, what kind of username is that? I M M zero W Z Z on YouTube, who says, "Are you guys working with the Hubble telescope, or are you guys just using pictures from NASA ESA from at least a year ago, or directly from STSCI?" Who wants to take that one? Uh, I I can take that one. Okay, um, go ahead, Steve. So so some of, some of all of that is true. So all of these images come from the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, but in particular for what I do, I'm using both images that are fresh off the telescope um, from candles and also some archival images, which means images that have been around for a while. So Romil talked a lot about how uh, candles is making use of this new camera, Wide Field Camera 3, that takes images in the infrared. And that's great for spotting Redshift 7 galaxies. Yeah. Um, but another piece of the puzzle you need to do that is optical imaging, so uh, images at, at wavelengths your eyes can see. And that's not what Candlest has done because that was already done by a survey called the Goods Survey uh, back last decade. And so um, when I'm doing my research, I'm using the Goods data, which I'm grabbing from an archive at Space Telescope. And Goods I'm is another survey. That's a different survey. Yes. Just Great Observatories Origins Deep Survey. Yeah. You're mixing different surveys, survey. dude. I know. But ca Candles, Candles is actually a marriage of Goods with, with another survey uh, led by Sandy Faber, Aegis. So it's, it's, okay. it's, it's not completely different. But it is different. Uh, in any case, so, so the answer is basically yes to everything you said. Uh, images downloaded okay. from a space telescope that were taken as long as 10 years ago and images that were just taken a month ago so whatever also works. downloaded from a space telescope. But so whatever works in the area of sky you're in, you're using data from that because you can never have too much. That's, that's for sure. So, okay. So here's a good question from Twitchy1003. He, and, uh, he goes, quick question. Is there an equivalence to, uh, of redshift to light years? Yes, absolutely. Okay, uh, let's hear it. Well, uh, let me just suggest that uh, you can go to 
Ned Wright, W R I G H T. Oh yeah, his cosmology his site. Yeah. Website and use his cosmological calculator. Yeah. Uh, There's if, also an iPhone app. There's an iPhone app, uh, Cosmo Calc, it's called. And uh, what you do is you put in the cosmological parameters. So you have to put in uh, the parameters that have been measured by Hubble and, and other instruments. And uh, and of course the the if you just download the app, uh, you'll find that it puts in the, the reasonable parameters by default. And then you just put in the redshift, and it'll tell you the age. It'll tell you yeah. how many uh, years ago, and it'll tell you how far away the galaxy was, and all of that stuff. I have to warn people, though, that uh, to really understand how far away the galaxy was when the light was emitted uh, takes uh, a little bit of background. Uh, it's based on general relativity, and these galaxies can be further away than 14 billion light years. Uh, the galaxy today can be that far away, even though the universe itself is less than 14 billion years old. So how that may seem like a contradiction, but it's not. It's it's the way the universe really works. So how how is so how is that possible? You can't just make a statement like that without backing it up a little bit. Well, the idea is that the universe has been expanding faster and faster for the last five billion years or so, and the distant objects are flying away from us faster than the nearby objects. And there's nothing that says that the distant objects have to be traveling less than the speed of light. That's People right. People often think that uh, relativity says that, that that's the absolute speed limit. And uh, that's not true. Not uh, when it comes the to the universe, expansion rate of the universe you're talking about, right? Yeah, the, the distant parts of the universe are flying away from us much faster than the speed of light, and that's according to relativity. I know, that blows people away. That, that totally blows people away when they think about that. They go, wait a minute, how, I made a video a long time ago about, and I made the statement that those galaxies were like 40-something thousand light years away, uh, or 40 uh, uh, billion about light 46 years away. 46 billion light years billion. away is how far away the most distant things we That's can right. see are. And, the, uh, and it, it just generated all sorts of uh, comments about how can that even be possible when the universe is only 13 billion years old. And, and this is why. The universe isn't... Is a, it, can expand uh, as fast as it wants. It's not limited by that by that uh, speed limit. So let me get another question in. Um, there was a couple. There was a really good one, and I lost it. Um, what always? This is from Arg523. He goes, "What always bugged me? Ellipticals are crushed or crashed galaxies. What about the structure? What about the structure has been destroyed by collisions? At the same time, larger spiral galaxies are supposed to form by collisions. So I guess what he's saying is there." We have spiral galaxies getting their shape from collisions, but we're also getting them from we're also getting ellipticals if they collide enough. I hope I'm I hope I'm translating that right. Does that does that question make sense to anyone? Sure, but I, what, well, Emil, why don't you take that one? Sure. Um, so you know the, um, it's it's interesting. Galaxy formation is a very complicated process. And uh, there are many things we don't understand, and one of those things is exactly how it is that these uh, ellipticals form. Um, so it is true that if you smash two spirals together, uh, you will get something that looks pretty much like elliptical. The, the reason is pretty straightforward. It's that uh, the spiral structure is a very delicate thing. It's a very ordered uh, rotation. It's, it's, uh, it's a, something that um, is easily disturbed. And if you throw a big thing into it, you know, you, it's like throwing a throwing a, a giant rock into a into a very still pond. You're going to mess everything up, and you randomize the orbits, and as a result, you end up with something that's that's essentially a bunch of random orbits, which is what a what an elliptical galaxy is. Now, we believe, I think, perhaps what the question is referring to is we believe that all galaxies are formed hierarchically. In other words, uh, galaxies start out small, and then uh, they merge together and join into larger and larger objects. And that's true to some extent, but it turns out that the way that process operates depends a lot on things like um, the, the epoch of the universe, and, or apparently depends a lot on things like the epoch of the universe in which that process is going on. So for instance, at high redshift during cosmic noon, it appears that uh, these mergers of galaxies may not necessarily result in the formation of these elliptical type galaxies. And the reason is that galaxies back then had a lot more gas. They had a lot more free gas floating around. And when you merge things that are very gas rich, uh, essentially because those, gas, those galaxies are young and they're, they're accreting gas at a very rapid rate back in the early universe, uh, when you merge gas rich galaxies, you can still 
uh, end up forming a spiral structure. The spiral structure essentially forms when you have a whole bunch of gas and it's settling down because the gas likes to settle into a, likes to lose energy, but you have angular momentum conservation, essentially the merry-go-round force that prevents the gas from getting into the middle. And so you end up forming a disk-like structure. Um, so uh, it is true that, that, that mergers and, and big uh, hierarchical events can produce both spheroidal type galaxies as well as uh, producing more spirals. And how exactly that all works out, we're not exactly sure. And that's you know, one of the reasons we're hoping to, to see uh, this process take place in candles. Wow, that's fascinating. So the, uh, the structure of a galaxy is largely uh, uh, one big factor is the amount of gas it contains. So, uh, yes. with the with with the uh, if you have a lot of gas and, and it, it, it tends to want it, it turns into a spiral shape, or at least that's one of the preferred shapes. But you get a lot of collisions of these spiral galaxies, and they eventually disrupt the gas. Uh, you know, stars are forming in the uh, in the uh, during the collisions, and then ultimately the gas becomes depleted. Is that true in uh, in ellipticals, more or less? Yeah, it's true to some extent. So the gas becomes depleted, but there is um, a rather remarkable fact that even at this day, for, for all the stuff that we see in galaxies, uh, more than, I would certainly more than 90% of all baryons in the universe are not inside of galaxies. They're sitting what are baryons? outside of galaxies. What are, what are baryons? you got to say what they are. <laughs> the baryons are the, the things in the periodic table. Okay. okay. All the Elements. stuff that, the high, mostly it's hydrogen and helium. Uh, but there's other elements, obviously, like us, have carbon, oxygen, etc. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So the, the rather remarkable thing is that there's all this gas out there in between galaxies. And gravity is a rather inexorable thing. It loves to push, pull the gas in, which means that the galaxies never run out of gas, which is why it's so difficult to understand the formation of these elliptical galaxies that are not forming stars. They have all this gas. We see the gas around the galaxies. We even see the gas cooling from the X-ray observations, uh, but somehow that gas is not forming down into stars, and we don't understand how that happens. So it's, it's not that the gas it just stops coming in. It's, it's rather that something is counteracting the ability of the gas to cool and, and radiate away its energy and fall down into the middle. Uh, we think it might have something to do with the big central black holes that's in all these galaxies, but we don't know for sure. Yeah, but that's counterintuitive. You'd think that would draw them in or make them closer, but I guess, you know. Yeah, that, well, yes, exactly. So <laughs> then it has to be the energy that's being released by the black hole, right? So, right. I mean, it's kind of a house of cards. This is what theorists do. They, they come up with wacky ideas when no other explanation makes sense. And awesome. so that's, you know, that's kind of what we're going with. Do you see these elliptical galaxies, the ones you're talking about, in all epochs of the universe, or do they tend to appear more in no, one than another? No, that's another very interesting question. It turns out that they appear, start appearing in great numbers right around cosmic noon. So right around redshift 2 to 3 uh, is when we start to see the emergence of these big uh, sort of not star-forming galaxies. Oh, wow. Uh, so so back, there's something back to noon. special going on then, which we don't quite understand. So Candles is really getting a good hand handle on this time period, it sounds like. You guys are really studying this cosmic noon period pretty well, pretty thoroughly. Yeah. All yeah, right. Absolutely. So, so uh, what, do you guys have any ideas what you think is going on in these galaxies? I mean, just some speculation that uh, why the stars aren't being formed, why it's not happening, or you don't yeah, want to guess? Yeah, I mean, uh, one of the interesting um, sort of uh, paradigms or, or, or ideas that has been uh, forwarded by theorists recently is that <laughs> galaxies are always drawing in matter, but in the early universe and in smaller galaxies, the matter tends to come in on very filamentary structures. I don't know if you've ever seen a picture of the so-called cosmic web uh, type scenario, where, where essentially you have the, the, the matter in the universe is distributed in these filaments and sheets. Yeah, and I've shown that many times in my videos, so yeah, they, they, I think the viewers are pretty familiar so with they've that. they've seen that, right. Yeah, the so, millennium. Simulation. In small galaxies, it appears the matter comes down these filaments relatively unimpeded and is allowed to get into the galaxy. In the larger galaxies, what happens because of an interplay of sort of you know various uh, shock heating processes, you start to build these uh, these galaxies, these halos of gas around these galaxies that are at millions of degrees kelvins or tens of millions of even a, a kelvin. These are very very hot gas, 
And that gas is somehow able to, that, that the presence of that gas is highly correlated with the fact that the object is not star forming. So it appears that something to do with this hot halo of gas is preventing uh, the material from, from continuing to be fed. The problem is that that gas should be cooling, but it's not. And so we have to think of an energy supply that is pumping that, that hot halo up. And because well, there's no star formation, it has to be the black hole. That's kind of the reason. Well, I know a lot of people are thinking what I'm thinking a little bit because we talk about this a lot in other venues. But uh, what about dark energy? I know that's a large-scale structure effect, but and does it, would it have any sort of effect within a galaxy? Not, not directly, no. Uh, dark, dark energy essentially uh, co governs the overall expansion of the universe. Right, right. Uh, but it's, it's essentially, you can think of it as a, as a vacuum pressure. So uh, it's essentially a, 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 a thing that allows vacuum to expand uh, more rapidly than you would think. So this question uh, I got uh, over uh, a per, uh, email, actually. And, and let me just ask this real quick. He goes, uh, Joel. Earlier on, you mentioned um, something about uh, the older older galaxies or old galaxies in the universe uh, tend to be distorted or disturbed. You said, why? Why is that? Why do you think that is? Why are the older galaxies so strange, so so broken up? Well, actually, uh, I would think of those galaxies as young galaxies. Uh, okay, young, young, young younger young. galaxies. That's better. Right, so the point sure. is that, that that the light has been traveling to us for. <coughs> the majority of the age of the universe. So uh, the light has been coming for a long time. So in that sense, they're old. But the light left them when they were very young. So what we're seeing is galaxies that were in the process of formation. The universe was much denser when those galaxies formed. How much denser? Well, uh, if you think of high noon as starting at redshift 3, the universe was four times smaller in each of the three different dimensions. So it's four times four times four, 64 times smaller than it is today. Uh, that is, it's 64 times higher density. So the result is that there were a lot more interactions between the galaxies, between the forming galaxies. If a galaxy uh, started to form a nice uh, disk with spiral arms, it's going to get hit by something pretty quick, almost always, back when the universe was uh, only a couple billion years old. And so that's probably a large part of why these galaxies look so much more disturbed than the nearby galaxies. Yeah, Another part of it is what we were talking about earlier, that these early galaxies had not converted too much of the gas into stars yet. And when you've got a lot of gas around, there are instabilities. Uh, the disk that's fed by the gas coming in on these filaments that Ramil was talking about uh, can clump up and form big clumps. And once you get a big clump of gas, the stars can form very rapidly. And so you get a lot of light coming out of these clumps. And so the galaxies look not smooth, but clumpy. Uh, we see a lot of galaxies that look like that. The simulations make galaxies that look like that. Uh, and the question is, do we really have the, the simulations uh, operating enough like the universe that the similarity is not just apparent, but when we really look carefully, they really do look the same, the, the simulated galaxies and the real galaxies. And as I was explaining earlier, we don't know the answer to that yet. Uh, we haven't done the careful comparisons. Okay. So uh, that's, that's a, a new frontier. Okay, so you guys are um, so you guys got the uh, the orbits to do to take all of this data, and I guess it's going to take you. You guys are have been doing this now already for several years, um, and you're about to. How much longer are you guys going to be taking data? About another year, right? Something like that. Does anyone know? Yeah, candles is a three-year project, okay. and uh, we're in year two now. Okay, so we got about a year, year left. We're in the third year now, right? I think we're, we're done. We're actually in the third in, year. Okay, so about I think a year we're done this summer sometime. Okay, so you, that's when you wrap up getting all of your data. What do you? When do you expect? Um, so, 
uh, is there a, is there a lifespan of the project beyond that? I mean, you guys are going to continue working and, and, and analyzing the data, right? Our funding uh, uh, continues a little bit, but we've we've used a lot, and we've already allocated most of the funds that we were given, uh, and we've already submitted dozens of papers, but uh, a lot more work is going to be done over the next year or two uh, awesome. as we try to understand all this data that's come in. Okay, well, um, I think we're about out of time, so um, I just wanted to uh, I want to thank all of you guys for showing up. This has been a, a hangout I've been wanting to have for a long time. There is so much stuff we didn't get to that I still want to talk about. So I hope we can do this again. If uh, you know, maybe other members of your collaboration that couldn't make it can join us next time. Um, but uh, I just wanted to thank you all very much for, for joining us and getting us a little, at least introduced to some of the things you're doing. You're doing some amazing science. I'm just really excited about the things you guys are finding out. I didn't get a chance to talk about the most distant galaxies yet that you've been looking at. I didn't get a chance to press you guys on whether or not this most distant thing is real uh, because I guess there's some, some uh, controversy, controversy on that or still working out the the uh, the details on whether it's true or not. So I'm hoping we can get to some of that stuff next time. So I hope you guys will come back. Yeah, definitely. So, oh, thanks. All right. Well, this was a lot of fun for me, and I want to thank I want to thank all of you guys. I want to thank Joel and Nina and Kathy and uh, Ramil and Stephen, all of you for for joining Alberto and I. Alberto had another meeting, so he had to go. Uh, I guess you know. Just again, thanks again for this. Has been a lot of fun for me. Well, thanks, so guys, Tony. I, oh, thank you're you very for welcome. hosting. You're very welcome. Guys, this is going to get posted on my YouTube channel uh, momentarily. I don't, it sometimes it takes as long as an hour to process the video, so I'll, I will. Uh, you'll be able to check it out on my channel uh, and record it after the fact. I'm going to add annotations. I'm going to add all the links that were mentioned in the in the here. I put a link to Ned's cosmology, Ned Wright's cosmology calculator on the event page, so you can already start playing with that if you haven't already. Many of you already do that, um, and. Uh, Hopefully we'll have the candles guys back real soon. I will be letting you guys know when the next hangout is uh, via Facebook, uh, Google Plus, uh, tweeting about it, all kinds of ways I can get the word out. So uh, I guess I just want to say thank you guys for watching, and as always, keep looking up.